This is another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. My name is Rebecca Tapp, and in every episode of Decoding Purpose, we speak to humans of both influence and impact to explore how life's turning points help us to decode purpose and to ignite a more meaningful and purpose-driven life. Welcome to another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. We are living in a VUCA world, short for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. A world defined by social change, economic change, or climate change. An age where emerging technologies meet global pandemics, where our social values converge with our political ones, and where old paradigms of thought and behaviour are being replaced by the new, the unknown and the uncertain. In a conversation about turning points, we are in a tornado of change and the only thing that seems crystal clear is the need for courage. So where do we begin in translating this complexity in order to gain clarity and from there to lean into the courage required to navigate an unwritten economy and future? I know this has been a burning question for me and one that led me to track down today's incredible guest, Kayla Colburn. Kayla is the co-founder of Boma Global and the CEO of Boma New Zealand. She spearheaded the hugely successful Singularity U New Zealand and Australia summits. After training with Brene Brown, Kayla became a certified Dare to Lead facilitator and has worked with hundreds of people to increase courage as a core skill the curator and licensee for TEDx Christchurch in New Zealand and TEDx Scott Base in Antarctica. That said, it is evident that Kayla is herself a global thought leader, not that she would frame it that way. She would prefer to see herself as a public intellectual with a focus on translating the gold-plated evidence, even when it's vulnerable, risky or requires radical acts of bravery. Please welcome to the podcast, the incredible Kayla Colburn. Kayla Colburn, it is such a pleasure to have you on the Decoding Purpose podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Oh, I'm so excited to have you here, especially after seeing you in action with our our fellow friends and colleagues at Future Crunch uh, on the Future Brunch webinar. So, you know, I was just like literally my face was melting in awe of all of your content. So to have you here is just really special. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. I had such a good time on that podcast and it's great to be here with you. <laughs> well, it, you know, today we're, we're, you know, doing audio, obviously doing a podcast, but I do hope you're wearing a brightly coloured jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Good. Kayla, look, I'm going to kick off with a question I ask every single guest on the Decoding Purpose podcast. You can consider it a little bit of field research. And I think this is a good question if I do say so. So here we go. Do you think that the discovery of your personal purpose is an intentional and intelligent decision or is the discovery of purpose influenced by fate or destiny? Wow. Yeah, we I go mean, there. Let's jump I in. mean, just, you know, no no foreplay, like no. right, into, <laughs> right, right into it. I we, love it. Yeah, let's set the tone. Let's go there. Awesome. Um, Okay. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's, th- I heard a few different questions in there. Yeah. Um, the questions that I heard are number one, um, uh, and, and you went somewhere different to where I expected you were going to go halfway through the question. So what I expected you to say is, do you think this is an intentional and intelligent process or is it something that emerges organically? Mm. Um, and I would say to that there, there is a bit of both, but I think the, the, the decision about, yes, this is my purpose should absolutely be in- intentional that the only way that it becomes useful, the only way that it becomes something that we can then, uh, apply as a filter for decision-making for prioritization is if we are absolutely intentional about what is driving us and where our hearts lie. Mm. Um, Arriving at that decision 
may involve a whole bunch of stuff that has happened organically that what you know weren't part of a uh, things that weren't part of uh, a process that you know today we're going to be establishing our purpose and the first we're going to do this you know discovery exercise and then we're going to do a brainstorming and then we're going to categorize you know it's it doesn't work like that so Getting to that point where you can make the intentional decision will involve a whole heap of organic things that are very difficult to plan out in advance. Where you ultimately went to with that question was um, uh, whether it's about fate, uh, which um, uh, speaks to, you know, a, a kind of nature versus nurture mm. uh, discussion. And uh, I definitely don't have answers to that. I feel uh, I, I feel that... Um, uh, I feel I actually feel very strongly in both camps. So I feel very strongly that it is up to me to have agency and choice in how I live my life. And I also recognize that that strong feeling may be a result, the inevitable result of all of the things that have led me to today over which I had limited to no control. Mm. So I'm going to total fence it. <laughs> On well, that question. <laughs> to, to give you some of the data, uh, having yeah. interviewed, oh gosh, we've, we've had probably nearly 40 guests on the podcast so far, maybe, mm. just to give you a stab in the dark figure. I, I reckon 99% of those guests have said both. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, good. I'm yeah. in good company then. You are in good <laughs> company, definitely. Now, I want to have have a look at some of those intentional decisions you've made uh, yeah. in your personal journey because I know you have been a serial entrepreneur since the age of 22. You were the curator and licensee for TEDx Christchurch in New Zealand and TEDx Scott Base in Antarctica. You trained with the incredible Brene Brown to become a certified Dare to Lead facilitator. And today you are the co-founder of Boma Global and the CEO of Boma New New Zealand. Not an overachiever in any way at all. <laughs> now, Easily bored. <laughs> absolutely. Look, there's there's actually a great quote by Steve Jobs that uh, basically states that you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So if you're looking backwards at your life, from my perspective, there's a clear link between the power of technology, the power of purpose, and the courage required to pioneer new futures. When you reflect and look back, what do you see or notice that you maybe didn't notice at the time of looking forward? Yeah, I, I love that you raised that quote. It's absolutely one of my favorites. It is, and um, I didn't some, actually share the whole quote. So I, I know, I know, I'm, I'm very familiar with it. Right, yeah. the creative people often feel like a bit of a fraud because we feel like we didn't actually do anything. Um, I, I, I refer to that often, and uh, uh, you know, every now and then I'll get questions about kind of careers advice, and I feel like I'm the least qualified person in the world to give careers advice because. Uh, I, I, my career has been built in such a forest gumpy way of like, oh, this looks like fun. Okay, I'll go do that. Mm, and just following um, the breadcrumbs. Yeah, <laughs> completely, completely. So, um, so, so looking back, there, there, are some things that come to mind. One is that um, I feel like there are lessons in this world that we cannot force ourselves to learn. That. The only way for me to um, start to grow into who I want to be as an adult is to have um, stuffed things up in such a profound way <laughs> earlier on in the piece that the, the lessons from those stuff ups get embedded in my bones. Mm. Um, and that, you know, you could have told me things like if if I could go back in time and tell my younger self things, I don't think there is any way to shortcut the journey that I have gone on in order to become who I am today. And the things that the the things that I that I did in terrible ways in the past, you know, avoiding difficult conversations or um, you know. Uh, uh, not being as skillful as I would like in my business activities. Um, in order for me to get there, there's there the I, I had to go on the road that I ended up going on. So um, so I think you know when I look back and connect the dots, my my overall sense is somewhat philosophical of 
you know, this is, I, I, I can't regret any of those mistakes or any of the, the windiness of that journey because it might look windy, but it was the most direct route to here. Does that make any sense? Oh, look, it, it makes perfect sense. And and in the context of, of Series 2 of this podcast, we are actually exploring turning points. And, and I'll tell you why. What I have discovered in having, you know, hundreds of conversations with people about how they discovered their purpose is that purpose itself, meaning, is more often than not catalyzed in these turning points. And sometimes they come about by choice, but more often they come about via a crisis or some kind of pain point. And I think in many ways, that's exactly what you're talking about there. Yeah, it, it's it's very true. And certainly when I look at some of the moments of most profound growth uh, for me, those have been the moments where I've been at my darkest or uh, at my lowest. Um, and had to kind of, um, work through that to go, Mm -hmm. who am I going to be in response to this moment? That being said, I will say my, my personal purpose, which is to be an uplifting presence. Um, I, I was very intentional about the choice of those words, but I don't remember when I said it and I don't remember it being particularly in context of something difficult that was happening. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, so yeah. Yeah. Look, I actually read that in your biography and what I love about your purpose is that it, it very much position, positions you to experience your purpose in the present moment where you're able to be purposeful in any moment with any person or any environment to be an uplifting presence. And I love that because I think so often we think of the North Star as the big goal or something that exists in the future without realising the North Star is within us and exists right now. And I think your purpose really captures that. Oh, thank you. I'm, I, I appreciate you saying that. I, mm. As I say, it was it was such an intentional process. Um, you know, I reflected on... Um, uh, do I want to have an impact? Do I want to help people? And your your comment about the North Star being within us is reflective exactly of what I was trying to capture there. Mm. That I cannot make my own um, my own fulfillment of my purpose dependent upon someone else doing or not doing or being grateful for help I've offered or whatever. I cannot. I don't want to position myself immediately as being any kind of savior or um, solver or fixer for other people. Um, You know, those are all kind of external measures of success. Um, My measure of success will be, have I shown up every day doing my best to be the best human Mm -hmm. that I'm capable of being? And that will vary from day to day and ideally will improve over time. Um, but you know, am I, am I showing up every, you know, Brene calls it getting into the arena. Am I showing up every day, willing to screw it up, willing to fail, but, but, but giving it my level best, um, leaning into it, uh, in such a way that others feel, um, that they can do the same Mm. and and whether they do or not, that's, that's not, that's not in, in my control and it's not something I can take credit for. All I can take credit for is how I choose to show up. Mm, Yeah, I love that. It's so, as I said, it's so empowered. It's so in the present moment. And it's about being truly accountable and anchored in our responsibility to ignite positive influence and to really see our own light or our, our own courage as something that is contagious and that has a ripple effect. Yeah. Beautiful. So whether it be, you know, through your work as an entrepreneur, a TEDx licensee or uh, spearheading Singularity U here in Australia and New Zealand and also with BOMA, you are clearly someone who has really spent a career being exposed to the most influential purpose-driven ideas. So I'm just wondering because I'm really curious to know, at this point in time, what idea or trend has, has piqued your interest or kept you up at night? <laughs> well, there is certainly a lot keeping me up at night. Um, you know, we, we live in, uh, uh, we're living through a, an incredibly challenging time. Um, I'm originally from the States, born and bred in New York City. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been in New Zealand for 15 years. And, um, you know, today I, I, I had a couple of meetings where people would say, how are you doing? Uh, and I'd say, well, I'm personally doing very well and um, struggling to balance that with the 
grief that I have for what's going on in the world and specifically in my original home country in the U.S. Um, so the, the thing that I am most interested in right now is um, how we can build towards a more um, a healthier, more functional, more thriving society um, where we are doing what we need to do to look after all members of, of our society. Um, and, uh, you know, from, from, from watching what's unfolding in the U.S., what I see is that it doesn't help you to have to be the home of Silicon Valley. It doesn't help you to have all sorts of innovations in terms of AI and uh, and tech. It doesn't it doesn't help to have a, a, a really robust you know financial market system um, that the underpinnings of our society will collapse if we don't have ways for each of us to be contributing with dignity, to be looking after our health, to be looking after our our, our bodies, our hearts, mm. uh, our relationships with each other. Um, uh, one of the, um, the, the things I often come back to is that um, I, I don't understand, you know, it's great that we've got uh, social enterprises as kind of a business category. I don't understand how we've set up a world where you can have an enterprise that is not a social enterprise that is not mm. that does not make some kind of contribution to the world and my reasoning for that is that you know if we're if we're thinking about things from the lens of corporations are have have personhood under the law then you and i as human persons don't just have legal and financial obligations to each other. We also have moral, civic and social obligations to each other. And what we're seeing right now in the US is that if you um, don't fulfill your legal and financial obligations, but you do fulfill your moral, social and civic obligations to each other, your society will pretty much be okay. Mm. But if you fulfill your legal and financial obligations, but fall down on the moral, civic, and social obligations, your society will crumble. And so this is the area that I'm super interested in right now is how can we be better at understanding how critical it is for all of us, whether we are human persons or corporate persons or whatever it may be, to fulfill our moral, civic, and social obligations to each other. Mm. Yeah, look, that that's really interesting. And, I, and I'm going to jump around a little bit here. And this was a question I, I would have uh, gone into a little bit later in the podcast, but I, but I think it's poignant with regards to what you've just said. And, you know, we, we've all had a little bit of time, I guess, over the last few months to, to reflect and ask ask much bigger questions about the kind of world we want to exist in. And one of the things I personally have been reflecting on is how valid the purpose economy is within a capitalist society. And the reason I say that is because, you know, don't get me wrong, I completely believe uh, that every business should have a return on impact. Um, however, you mentioned in one of your speeches that I watched online um, something that really piqued my interest when you mentioned that one of the things, again, that kept you up at night was the inequality of emerging technology in that the wealth goes to the people who can afford it. And when it comes to the idea of the purpose economy, I kind of feel a little bit the same way at this point in time in that you can change the world if you can afford it. Um, and if you just consider like conscious consumerism as an example, it's, it's really expensive. So people who don't have that kind of money or who are living in the slums in India can't afford to buy, you know, Adidas shoes made out of ocean plastic, even though that is amazing. So I absolutely, you know, I, I believe in, in social enterprise, and I think this is key in creating progressive social change, but at the same time, it feels like the solution is bigger than business, um, that it might be time that we needed to possibly rethink an economy uh, that isn't built upon growth and is more focused on on inclusivity and sustainability or even resilience at this particular point in time. So I'm interested you know, to understand what your thoughts are on that and what kind of economy you would write to create a sort of more a fairer, more equitable and sustainable world. Yeah. Awesome. There's so much in that. So I know I you. feel like it's there was. Great. No, it's <laughs> great. I love with it. Me there. <laughs> I, I love it. There's, there's so much meat there. Um, so some of the things that, that came up for me during um, what you were saying, number one is um, the recognition 
that a lot of our conversations about purpose carry inher inherent privilege in them. Mm. Um, and that there is a risk of us making assumptions um, that apply only to people who look like us or sound like us or come from a similar background to ours. Um, and so uh, I remember uh, way back when Jamie Oliver did a, a series um, on um, chicken, a TV show about chicken. Mm -hmm. And he went and talked to the farmers and he went and talked to the supermarkets and he looked at what, what it looks like to have a, you know, cage chickens versus um, cage free versus free range and all the different kind of categories and, you know, what happens along the process. And, uh, and I loved it so much because he really came at it from a perspective of helping us understand, like, why would the farmers do this in this way if they're doing cage ch battery chickens, right? Why would the supermarkets do this in, in this way? And understanding the pressure from consumers on having chicken, more, less expensive chicken be available. And then the pressure that the supermarkets put on the farmers to be able to do that. And then the pressure that the families uh, are experiencing because they're trying to feed their kids and they don't, you know, they can't afford a, a $12 chicken. They need a $5 chicken, right? And so, um, so he really came at it from such a place of non-judgment. And at the end of the show, he said, here is what I am asking from you. I am asking for you to buy the best quality chicken you can afford, which I thought was so beautiful. You know, he wasn't mm. saying like buy free range chicken or you're doing it wrong, in which case people who are on a single income or on a benefit are going, well, I'm going to be doing it wrong because I cannot afford to feed exactly. my kids. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That's beautiful. So, um, so, so recognizing that, that inherent privilege that you've, that you've identified is, it's so critical. Um, number two, uh, you talked about the the kind of failures of capitalism here, and a hundred percent, it's they're partly failures of capitalism and partly failures of our understanding of what is the purpose of capitalism. Like, what does it do well, and what does it not do? What should we not look to it for? Mm. So, um, so as I said before, um, I think it is very strange that we have businesses that are not required in some way to talk about their impact on the rest of like to me the, to me this is a fundamental failure of the way we've set up the system that we allow people to operate you know people we allow businesses to operate without without any kind of accounting uh for you know whether they are whether they're doing uh, uh overall uh, having an overall positive impact or not that's mm. that's one critical thing um, but the second thing is there is lots of discussion. I'll give you uh, at least two that I can reference. I'm not an economist and this is not my area of expertise, but at least two that I can reference of, uh, you know, where people are thinking about different ways that we could be structuring things that could be overall, overall create a, a healthier society, a more functioning society, a more um, impactful society. One of them is Kate Raworth and, and Donut Economics, mm. which is instead of thinking about economics, uh, in the sense of um, capitalism, which requires constant growth in order for it to continue to deliver on its promise. We think about economics in, in the sense of there is a range in which we can operate that will be the healthy range. And that's a range where there are minimums, where we need to be able to feed ourselves, we need to be warm, we need to be healthy, we need to have education. And there's a, there's an outer limit to that range, which is we if we extract further, we will be depleting the resources necessary to basically allow us to thrive. Mm -hmm. um, so Kate Raworth's Donut Economics is a really good way to think about that. The other one is a talk that we had at our TEDx Christchurch event last year, uh, which has since been published on TED.com, which is Marilyn Waring. Um, talking about GDP and what GDP measures and what it does not measure. Um, and that's a, she is a, she's a brilliant economist. She was, um, uh, she's been nominated for the Nobel Prize in economics. She's, um, was one of New Zealand's youngest uh, MPs in parliament uh, way back when. Um, she has been a forward thinker for longer than, you know, she, she's forgotten more than I will ever know about this kind of stuff. Um, and, um, you know, this idea that the, the measures that we use to measure the health of the economy are proxies. Wall Street, mm. the Dow Jones is a proxy for the health of the economy. It is not the health of the economy. It is a proxy for the health of the economy. And it's a poor proxy for the health of the economy. And the economy itself, the movement of money, is a proxy for how much each of us is thriving. And again, it's a poor proxy for that.
So I think part of our role is to be, number one, recognizing these things as the proxies that they are, and then doing a better job of what is it we're actually trying, what is the question we're actually trying to ask that we're using money or the stock market as a proxy for, and is there a better way to ask that question? Mm. I mean, and fundamentally what we're talking about here is is the potential of a currently unwritten future or unwritten economy. Uh, again, if we come back to this idea of turning points, in your opinion, if this was to happen, uh, say, you know, the, the donut economics that you were just referencing or, or a type of circular economy even, do you think that had happened by choice or by crisis? Uh, well, I know that Kate is working with some cities mm. to look at adopting donut economics as their standard platform. That's amazing. Um, it is. That's amazing yeah, her, to know that that's actually already, you know, being yeah. seeded. Yeah. And there's another one. I think her name is Mariana Matsukato. Um, don't hold me to that. Um, but I, I, uh, another one who's thinking really differently about economics. Um, do I think it would happen by choice or by crisis? I, you know, we're, we're already in crisis. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're 100% Which is kind of why I'm crisis. asking the question, is, is this the turning point possibly? Yeah. yeah. Well, so uh, and... And do we have sufficient resources left to to make it a turning point such that it yields something healthy? Mm. Um, so, um, you know, I've been I've, I've spoken to I've been I talked to a lot of people in the States on a pretty consistent basis. And I've had a couple of people say to me, you know, the lockdown is terrible because you know, we've got so many people who are at home in abusive relationships, or we've got so many people who, if they don't go to work, then they can't afford to eat. And, um, you know, the lockdown is kind of killing them. And my response to that is that's the lockdown isn't killing them. Like the lockdown is revealing how broken the system was to begin with. The lockdown is showing that we have done a very poor job of setting ourselves up to be resilient, of setting ourselves up to be healthy, of setting ourselves up to look after each other. Like this, the, the lockdown isn't the cause. The lockdown is the catalyst that, you know, it's basically like if you put a quarter in the vending machine, a, a coin in the vending machine, um, and there's no candy bar in there, it doesn't matter how many coins you put in the vending machine, the candy bar is not going to come out, mm -hmm. right? Like you have to have the conditions in place in the first place for the lockdown to have this negative impact. Um, and what we need to be looking at is how broken the system was in the first place, such that it turned out that not only were the majority of American families living paycheck to paycheck and $400 away from bankruptcy, um, but so were most of our companies paycheck to paycheck and, mm. you know, one, one, uh, one month away from not being able to make payroll. Um, so these, so, so I think what this crisis is going to force is, um, through breakdown, um, a revisiting, what I hope this crisis forces is through breakdown, a revisiting of those underlying structures that have allowed us to get to this point in the first place. Yeah. Kayla, you know, I think it's it's fair to say that at this point in time, there are certainly um, some pretty scary things happening out there, but there are also still some extraordinary things happening out there. And, and I want to talk about that. Great. Um, I know that you are deeply passionate about the power of uh, exponential technologies and their impact on humanity. So I, I want to dive in here a little bit and um, I have a few questions. The first one is for the people out there who maybe don't nerd out on techno technology, what is exponential technology? Yeah, so exponential technology um, or technologies refers to technologies where uh, the price performance is advancing at an exponential rate. I'll explain. So Thank you. <laughs> when, when, we talk, when we talk about the price performance, what we're talking about is um, if you take computers as an example, how many million instructions per second can you buy for $1,000? Right. So uh, price performance refers to either um, how much performance you can get for a fixed price. So in this case, instructions per second for a thousand dollars or how much how much the price is changing for a fixed level of performance. So, for example, when we talk about gene sequencing uh, mm -hmm. and we look at the cost to sequence one entire human genome, um, how much that cost has come down over time. That's an example of price performance. So with exponential technologies, what's happening is that price performance is doubling 
on a consistent basis. So with uh, computers, for example, the most uh, famous instance of this is Moore's Law, Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel, who in 1965 made the observation that the number of transistors we could fit on, a, on an integrated circuit had been doubling every 18 months as far back as we could see. And he made a prediction that that number would continue to double as far forward as we could see. So Moore's law, Gordon Moore was referring sp specifically to this like physical, how many transistors we can put on a chip. Um, Ray Kurzweil was the one who zoomed out on this and said, forget about, it doesn't matter whether it's transistors or not. What he was interested in was this concept of price performance. And when he zoomed out on this and he said, if we think about this, instead of transistors, we think about it in terms of price performance. The price performance has been doubling consistently for 120 years starting way back mm. with the beginning of computing with electromechanical punch cards, moving on to relays and then vacuum tubes and then transistors and only then integrated circuits. So Moore's law is actually the fifth iteration of this underlying doubling paradigm rather than the first. Um, so what happens and, and why is it so important to care about doubling, you know, these things doubling? It's because um, number one, uh, exponential curves look flat for a really long time. Um, and you'll know this if you've ever tried to do that trick where you fold mm. a piece of paper in half eight times, right? Like it's easy, 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 and then impossible. Um, because they look flat for a really long time, they're really easy to underestimate. Uh, and yeah, so we don't a, appreciate it. As a their... metaphor, I can almost see it as a, as a pyramid rising from the ground. If you've got a pyramid made out of bits of wheat, as an example, the higher it goes, you know, you've got the the... I'm actually, I'll probably let you explain, but visually I can see that the higher it goes, um, you know, you've got your most expensive on the top when it's just one, but it, as it grows, it becomes less and less expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, continues absolutely. to expand from there. <laughs> Yeah. And in fact, grains of wheat is one of the metaphors we use all the time. Yeah, but, okay. but we, we go back to the apocryphal story of the of the guy who invented chess. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that, that he, he, he brought the game to the king and he said, Sire, I have invented this game. I wish to gift it to the kingdom. And the king said, this is a wonderful thing indeed that you have wrought. How would you like to be rewarded? And the inventor says, I am but a simple man, sire. I ask for not much, merely a single grain of wheat on the first square of the chessboard mm. and two on the second and four on the third and eight on the fourth and so on until such time that the board should be full. And the king says to himself, this, is, uh, this man is very clever with games, but he knows not how to value his contribution. And he readily agrees to the inventor's request. And of course, you can imagine where this is going. By the time the board's full, the king would have owed the inventor something in the order of 15 quintillion grains of wheat. Uh, put them all together, it adds up to something like 1.2 trillion metric tons, which is like 1,600 times the total output of wheat globally for all of 2017. Um, and so what happens is these things look like nothing, 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 and then everything. And because of that, we get a whole bunch of people saying it came out of nowhere. There's no way we could have known. Mm. Right. This is where we get these stories of like, you know, the, the, the head of IBM saying the total global market for computers is maybe five. Where we get people saying, you know, there's no way um, you could ever... Uh, you know, where, where we currently have in, in the phones in our pockets, we've got thousands of times more computing capability than what sent the Apollo astronauts to the moon. Um, because it's nothing, 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 and then everything. And, um, and so when we see these exponential curves in action, because they are so deceptive, um, we have to be systematic and disciplined in our assessment and our analysis of them so that we can be able to respond effectively. Mm. So can, can you link for me how exponential technologies, I guess, ignite turning points in order to create more purpose-driven futures? So I would not say that there is an inevitable causal relationship between exponential technologies and purpose-driven futures. Okay. Um, I think that, um, you know, what we've seen with technology, it, it, inevitably, when I, if you ask people about the future, people will either say everything's going to be awesome or everything's going to be terrible. Um, and inevitably, we get something in between, right? Like our, our nature is to predict either utopia or dystopia. And ultimately, Ultimately, what we get is, you know, we've got iPhones, like amazing, mm. and we have the government listening in on our calls because of five eyes or whatever. Um, so um, so we, we, we have this, this something kind of somewhat in the middle. So, for example, um, you know, take Facebook. Facebook's a perfect example. Um, Facebook has allowed um, people to connect with each other in ways that was unfathomable previously. Um, I've got a Facebook group going with 
my extended family, which is now doing a whole family tree thing of, you know, where we were during the Holocaust and, um, you know, connecting with each other in ways that just, you know, would, would be much more difficult to do um, prior to Facebook. Mm -hmm. With with uh, platforms like Facebook, we also run huge risks of filter bubbles, of uh, misinformation and disinformation, of concentration of power uh, in in ways that are um, undermining our democratic society. Um, so again, these kind of huge challenges that have been wrought. So I do not I do not come from from a view of exponential technologies will fix everything um, and will will save us all. What does happen is they allow us um, to be able to accomplish things that we would really struggle to accomplish without them. And so, for example, um, I want to fly less. I'm an I'm a I'm a a, a knowledge worker. I can, my my contribution to the world is through my brain activity, not through my my physical activity. Um, I want to fly less. Thanks to the magic of Zoom and Hopin and uh, all the other platforms, I can contribute and participate remotely in ways that I couldn't have done 10, 15, 20 mm. years ago, right? Um, that's magical. Um, what happens when we advance in technology, um, the, yes, there is a concentration of wealth towards the holders of capital. And at the same time, we, a, as the price comes down for a given level of technological capability, um, that becomes accessible, becomes democratized to millions or billions of people who, again, hadn't had that previously. So we get systems in Africa where people are doing payment exchanges via text. Um, we get systems where, you know, a kid in uh, uh, the countryside in Turkey um, can make a, a, a movie and upload that to a video sharing platform where previously they would have to, you know, scrape up the money and find countries and make their way to Hollywood to try to get exposure. So, um, so I, I sit, my preferred place to sit is with the complexity of the world. Mm. Um, even though there is a temptation to go, oh, this will inevitably drive us to be a more compassionate future. I think our, our greater levels of compassion, our greater levels of purpose, those are all choices that we have to make as people. They will not be given to us by our technology. They will not be given to us by, uh, automatically by having, by virtue of habit, having capitalism break down. They are choices that we need to collectively make, and it is up to us to make those choices. Mm. And look, one of the areas where I think it's fair to say we are definitely seeing impact, particularly in the fields of, say, science and innovation, is is via something called convergence, which you spoke about uh, in one of the speeches that I researched. Can you talk talk me through this idea of convergence with regards to technology? Yeah, a hundred percent. So often we talk about, um, you know, in in the work that I did for a few years, um, helping people better understand the nature of exponential technologies mm. and, and and their implications. Um, I, I often ended up with a feeling of we were looking at the technology kind of in a vacuum. Mm. And uh, when I think about convergence, what I'm thinking about is the fact that we're not only experiencing a world of technological change. We are also experiencing geopolitical change. We're experiencing social change, economic change, climate change. And all of these vectors of change are converging to create this world that is highly, you know, uncertain, unpredictable, this VUCA world, right? Volatile, mm. uh, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And again, if we want to be sophisticated and effective in terms of being able to realize our purpose, in terms of being able to have a, a, a profoundly positive contribution, we have to look at these things as interconnected rather than as isolated. Um, and so, for example, um, we cannot look at the impact of social media platforms we can't look at the rise of um, demagogic leaders around the world in isolation from the rise of social media platforms and algorithmic content recommendation. Mm. Um, we cannot look at um, uh, the, the greater concentration of wealth without looking at um, the algorithmically driven um, market trading that dominates what's happening um, with the stock market. Um, and so we, we think about these things as kind of independent, um, and yet their impact and their net result is entirely interdependent. And we have to think about, uh, we have to think about them through that lens of complexity. It's much harder to do. 
I read a piece ages ago that had a really profound impact on me. It was it was a long form article would have been in like the Atlantic or the New Yorker, you know, one of those long form, <laughs> yeah. form uh, uh, publications. And it was talking about the difference between the thought leader and the public intellectual. And what it said was, you know, the thought leader is someone who, you know, has a, 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 a one line narrative. Maybe that narrative is like exponential tech is going to make everything better <laughs> or, you know, 10,000 hours or whatever it is. There's like a, 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 a an easily understandable headline. And maybe they've, you know, given a TED talk about that or they've written a book about that and they've, you know, found data to support that kind of nice headline. And they've spun that into a bit of a brand for themselves. Um, and the thing about the thought leader is that that is easy to digest. It is easy to share, it is easy to sell, it is easy to comprehend and then feel like you now understand it yourself. Um, it's not necessarily reflective of the, the, the world as we know it. The public intellectual, on the other hand, is embracing the complexity of the world, is looking at all of the data, whether it supports mm. the headline or doesn't support the headline, um, is um, harder to grasp, is less satisfying, um, is, uh, is a, a, a greater liability because you think you go, oh, right, this person feels this way about these things. And then they go, well, actually there's this other side to it. Um, but is more reflective of the true complexity of the mm. world in which we live. Mm. And that's where I try to come from. Yeah. With I, I love it, you know, and I think it, it's at the heart of, of honest and positive influence to be able to truthfully, truthfully translate what other people might not be able to fully conceive without that translation. So, you know, it's, it's very much about being in service. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So Kayla, over the course of, of today's interview, we have obviously talked about technology. We've talked about fate, choice, crisis, and ultimately the creation of unwritten futures. But the golden thread within all of this sits in something much deeper and more visceral than the world around us because it asks us to look within ourselves and it asks us to really think about how we lead others and how we lead ourselves courageously. So as a starting point, are you able to define what courage is? Sure. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so the definition of courage uh, and, and what I'll be drawing on here is the training that I did with Dr. Brene Brown mm -hmm. uh, to facilitate her Dare to Lead curriculum um, and the research that she and her team have done in this area, which is research that uh, uh, includes studies uh, that involved uh, Rice, Kellogg and Wharton schools of business. Um, and what the research tells us is that, number one, our single most accurate measure of courage is our willingness to lean into vulnerability. That the definition of vulnerability is risk, uncertainty, and emotional exposure. And that the kind of complete package of skill sets of courage include not only that willingness to lean into vulnerability, but also uh, how much we live into our values, um, how much we are able to trust and be trustworthy, and how well we are able to rise, how well we are able to be resilient in the face of setbacks. Um, and there's a really, when we talk about that, that, that primary measure of courage being our willingness to lean into vulnerability and that definition of vulnerability being risk, uncertainty, and emotional exposure, there's a really simple exercise you can do to test for yourself whether this, uh, whether this is true. And the test is just think of a time when you've seen someone doing something courageous. Mm. Uh, it could be somebody you know, somebody you don't know, you know, something recent, something from a long time ago. Look, and I, just I'm going to um, share an example just right from this interview because I was yeah. just reflecting on it. And that moment before where I mentioned the pyramid example in, yeah. in my attempt to conceptualize what exponential technologies was about, it didn't really land. And I'm going to use this example because everyone would have heard this and, and before I would have been like, mm, I'm going to edit that out, but I'm not going to edit it out because I'm going to use it as a case study. Because in that moment, I had to go, okay, this is how I'm conceiving it. 
I'm going to be courageous enough to say it, even if it doesn't land. And when it didn't land, I felt all of the emotional exposure and <laughs> shame and vulnerability. And I just want to use that example because we can think of all these, these you know, big examples in our own lives or people we know, but sometimes courage is just that, right? <laughs> that, that was so... That was, for me, that was a moment of courage and a moment of feeling vulnerable. So <laughs> that is, you're you're one hundred percent spot on there. Yeah. And you know, we we you're so right. We think of when we when when you explicitly ask people to think of courage, what they'll think about is like, oh, I'm rescuing a kid from a burning building or whatever. Yeah. And yet, every day there are a million tiny opportunities for us to display courage. So here's a great example: mm. if you've ever seen someone give a talk and then they're like, any questions? The first person to put their hand up, that's an act of courage. Mm. Anybody willing to sit in the front row, that's an act of courage. Asking for a pay rise, that's an act of courage. Having a difficult conversation with your spouse, that's an act of courage. Asking someone on a date, like all of these things, any time that we are like putting ourselves out in the world in a way that we could get knocked back, all of those require courage. Mm. So let's let's lean into the difficult conversations piece because I think yeah. that's a, a really big one. And I think it's also vital for anyone seeking a more purpose-driven life for the simple reason that I feel the purpose, purpose really asks us to step into our power. And sometimes that means having boundaries. Uh, sometimes it means cracking, cracking open an uncomfortable illusion, ours or someone else's. Or it might mean, you know, quashing the status quo status quo and that is often scary so how do we activate the courage to firstly hear our own truth and then to share that truth with another person yeah so um so what i'll come back to for that um and and, and again i love your questions i feel like each one of your questions we could spend hours <laughs> on <laughs> um what i'll what i'll come back to for that if we're thinking about difficult conversations um, you know, the terminology we use on the Dare to Lead program is, is a rumble. And a rumble is a meeting or conversation that's characterized by a few commitments. Um, one of those is the commitment to lean into vulnerability. Mm. Um, so if, we're, if I'm going to have a difficult conversation with you, I've got a choice in how I show up in that conversation. I can show up armored, ready for battle, ready to blame you, ready to be angry at you. Or I can show up armor off, ready to be wrong, ready to hear you, ready to sit with my own kind of contribution to this situation, right? So one, a commitment to lean into vulnerability. Um, two, uh, a commitment to own our own parts. Um, three, a commitment to stick with it, to stick with the kind of messy middle, because, you know, inevitably these conversations, you open them up and it gets, it gets, you know, it, it gets harder before it gets easier, right? And so we have to stick with them in order for them to um, to be to get resolved and come out the other end. Um, there's another commitment that we make that sounds kind of contradictory contradictory to that previous one, which is the 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 willingness to take a break and circle back when necessary. And we just talk about that because you know we've all been in those conversations where like the temperature starts going up and you're you know you, you, you like you turn into a frilly mm. neck dragon and all of a sudden you're like your all of your good intentions have kind of gone out the window and your anger is has taken over um and the, the kindest thing you can do at that point to yourself and to the other person in the conversation is to say i just need to take five minutes or 20 minutes or you know take a a, a few laps around the block so that i can calm down and show up as my best self for this conversation um, but the final commitment is is also my favorite and one I think we should be carrying with us at all times, every day, whether we're having a difficult conversation or not. And that is the commitment to listen with the same passion with which we want to be heard. Oh, I love that. Can you repeat that? Absolutely. To listen with the same passion with which we want to be heard. Oh, what I, you know, I just, I, I really feel that statement on, like on a visceral level. And, awesome. and the reason for that is because, you know, we spend a lot of time hearing, but we don't spend a lot of time listening. Yeah. Yeah. And so often our listening is biding time. Um, our listening is listening for the trigger that allows us to provide our contribution. Mm. Um and one of the most powerful things we can do, especially in difficult conversations, is to say, 
I hear you. I acknowledge you. I, I understand where you're coming from. Your position is valid. And to just sit with that before moving on to, but let me tell you my thing or, but let me, you know, but I'm coming from a different place or, you know, let's bring it over to me now um, to, to really just sit, sit with someone else's position is valid. And I think oftentimes we're afraid to do that because we're afraid that like, if, if you and I are having an argument and you tell me all the reasons you're angry at me and I say, I totally understand where you're coming from. Um, that does not mean that number one, I don't, I won't get the opportunity to be heard myself. Mm. Um, it does mean that I have to be willing to sit with the ways in which I have not shown up as my best self in this interaction. Mm. And that can be really difficult to do. Well, that comes back to the vulnerability piece, doesn't it? Totally. Mm. Mm. Totally. Here, one of the things I always say about these, about rumbles and difficult conversations is that I think about them the same way that I think about workouts. Like I never want to, I never want, like rumbles are always uncomfortable. No matter how much you practice them, no matter how good you get at being courageous and having difficult conversations, it never gets easy. You're never like, yeah, now I get to go have a really hard conversation with somebody. Awesome. It's going to be fun. You know, it never gets easy. There's always like a bit of a sense of dread and a bit of a sense of like, can I, can I get out of this uh, in some way? Um, but you always feel better for having done them. And I feel like I feel about them the same way I feel about my workouts, which is like, I'm always glad to have had done it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really interested to talk about how we change state because, you know, <laughs> to use a metaphor, when I think of courage, I, I think of the Wizard of Oz and, and the courageous lion who's actually terrified inside. And so if we are like the lion in, in that moment, uh, say when, when we're trying to actively hear someone, as an example, and we feel all of that fear come up, we feel that vulnerability come up with its emotional exposure and, and all the shame that goes with that. Firstly, if we have the awareness to notice all of that, from there, how do we shift state? What are the steps to, to really be able to transform that fear into courageous action? Yeah, well, the awareness is the first step. The awareness in and of itself mm. drives transformation. So if I am, <clears throat> if I am feeling shame about something and I've let the shame take over and I've let my anger take over and, uh, you know, we, you and I go into a conversation together and, um, my engagement with you is driven by that shame and by that anger, it's going to go terribly. It'll go terribly for both of us, right? Like mm. you're not going to, you're going to feel terrible and I'm not going to get the outcome that I want. If I can sit with the awareness, the presence to be able to go, oh, what I'm feeling right now looks like anger. When I dig into it further, there are elements there of resentment. And when I dig into it further, because what's driving the resentment is an element of powerlessness. And the way that I got to powerlessness is by not being willing or able to set and maintain my own boundaries which drove me to feel powerless because then you had control over me, which drove me to feel resentment because then you had control over me, which is now being expressed as anger. And at the heart of all that, working back through the anger, through the resentment, through the powerlessness, at the base of it is shame, which is this feeling that uh, I'm shame. The definition of shame is the deeply painful feeling that we are somehow flawed and not worthy of love, belonging, or connection. Mm. And often that is what stands in the way of us being able to set and maintain healthy boundaries, for example. Because what if I set a boundary and I say, I'm not willing to do this? And you say, okay, then leave. Mm. And does that mean then that I'm, that I've, that I'm not good enough? I've been kicked out of the tribe. And these are like, these are things that are evolutionary in terms of their nature, their, their seriousness, their importance, because, you know, we evolved to be tribal creatures and any sense, if I'm going to get kicked out of the tribe, that is life or death for me. 
Mm. right? If I get kicked out of the community. And so any sense that I might not be worthy of love, belonging, or connection, that's not just like a touchy feely, nice to have thing. This is like, I will be kicked out of the tribe and I will die. Yeah. I will be eaten by saber tooth tigers. That is not okay. And so it, you know, it's one of the most primitive emotions we have that, you know, we all have it unless we're uh, psychopaths or sociopaths. And so being aware of that and going, oh, what's at the heart of that is this deep fear that I'm not good enough. That simple awareness is transformative in and of itself. Mm. So Kayla, I've, I've actually arrived at my last question today. And, you know, I have to say it's been such an honor talking to you. And so my question is this, if you were in a room acting as a teacher to a room of say, say 10 year olds, the next generation, what would be two or three things you would want them to know about the discovery of their life purpose and the creation of a, a more abundant and peaceful future? Oh, I love this question so much. <laughs> um, so I have three stepsons. Uh, they are 12, 10, and 6. And um, they are such phenomenal kids and we have such interesting conversations about all of this stuff. Um, and really, I feel, you know, Brene describes the, the courage work as the primer and the top coat for all of the other work. So if we're gonna have conversations about purpose, if we can't, if we don't have courage, if we don't have self-awareness, if we're not willing to lean into vulnerability, then none of the purpose conversations are gonna go anywhere. Um, if we want to have conversations about technological transformation and abundant futures, uh, if we can't have difficult conversations, if we can't uh, uh, engage healthily with our fears and feelings, none of those con conversations about technological transformation are going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so the conversations that I have with the kids focus a lot on helping them understand themselves, their own emotions, bringing that awareness that you talked about um, into their own activities. And what I can say is that kids are never too young to begin these conversations. So I'll give you an example. Uh, our oldest uh, is uh, the 12 year old. When he was six, he used to fly into these rages where he would like, uh, you know, claw at his chest and his face would get beat red and he'd be like clawing at the walls and, you know, just these like physical rages. Mm -hmm. And it was really intense to see. And he's, he's, he's not a big kid. And so it was like, you know, this kind of, cognitive dissonance of like this, this, this little kid, you know, with this, the, this rage that was so much bigger than he was. And I remember one day he, uh, he flew into this rage and he ended up running outside and, and getting into the back of the car and just spending some time out there. And I, a after a little while, I followed him out and I, I got into the front of the car, uh, uh, into the driver's seat and I was just sitting, looking forward. So he was behind me. So I didn't want to, you know, put him on the spot with my gaze. And I sat there for a little while and then I asked him, so, you know, I see, I see how angry you get. You know, I see your, your face gets red. I see you kind of clawing at your chest and clawing at the walls. So but what I'm curious about is what does that feel like for you in your body? And he said, I feel like I could take out a building. Mm. Six years old. And so when you asked before about how do we transform state? And I said, well, that simple awareness is, you know, the first step to transformation. The way that we get to awareness oh, is I've by bringing. <laughs> it was Just intense. The, the power to teach a child to anchor in their body that way. Yeah. And to, to help them to develop that as a skill. That's like, that's genius. Well, and if we want to bring awareness into our feelings, that's where we have to come back to yeah. is in our bodies. You know, we have this, this myth that feelings are not physical. They are entirely, the only way you know you have a feeling is because you have a physical experience. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the way that you know that you're scared is because the hairs on the back of your neck have stood up and your heart started beating faster and your mouth's gone dry and your palms have gone sweaty. Like, that's how you know you're scared. It's not like you got an email in your head that tells you that you're scared. 
Mm. So, um, so if I were, um, were, were teaching a room full of 10 year olds, this is what I would be teaching. I would be teaching them to understand that all of the intense emotions that they feel are normal and human and part of all of us and nothing to be ashamed of and part of the process. I would teach them to be bringing that awareness into their bodies so that they have the ability to um, to remain calm, to observe what's going on for them, and to respond in healthy ways rather than being driven by their emotions without understanding what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would teach them to show up and lean into those difficult moments, even and especially when they are difficult, uh, because if their go-to response is to run away, um, then they will struggle for the rest of their lives. But if they can cultivate from a young age when this is difficult, I'm going to show up and sit with the, the 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 need to apologize or own my experience or acknowledge my anger or whatever it may be. That will set them up for beautiful lives in the future. Kayla, it's it's been such an honour to have you on the podcast. And look, I've actually brought up in front of me the the Boma Global Boma New Zealand website, um, and I'm wondering if you would mind sharing with our listeners where they can learn more about Boma, learn more about you, and and also understand you know a little bit more about what you guys offer and the courses that you have available. Yeah, absolutely. So our website for New Zealand is just nz.boma.global. So that's uh, nz.boma.global. Um, we're part of the Global Boma Network, which you can find at just boma.global. Um, we have some courses coming up that are um, virtual. So uh, whether your listeners are in Australia or elsewhere, for example, we've got um, the full Dare to Lead program we're running virtually uh, starting in a couple of weeks. Um, and there are some spots left on that. So um, so people can feel free to uh, to participate in that. Um, and lots of ways to get a hold of me, uh, either through our website or on social media. I'm very easy to find. Kayla Colburn, thank you so much for joining me on the Decoding Purpose podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. If you have enjoyed the podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review. That would be greatly appreciated. And we'd also love you to join the Purpose Movement at Instagram by following us at Decoding Purpose Podcast. Also, a big shout out to our sponsors at Supernova Sound.